Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless spiritual warfare is off the charts battle lines are being drawn and people are choosing sides ephesians 5 11 and 12 and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather expose them for it is shameful even to speak for those things which are done by them in secret ephesians 6 12 but we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. 1 Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter time some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. As pushback continues around the country over drag performances, a church became the venue for a drag queen Bible story hour in San Francisco. Organizers say they were hoping to provide a different perspective. Today we're holding a drag queen Bible story hour. Reverend Victor Floyd says it's a first for Calvary Presbyterian Church. They've held a pre-pride prayer service before, but this is something new. Matthew 24 11. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. False prophet is the Greek word pseudo-prophetes, which means a pretended foreteller or religious imposter. A false prophet is a person who spreads false teachings or messages while claiming to speak the word of God. Rather than speak the word of the Lord, false prophets deliver messages that originate in their own hearts as we read in Jeremiah 23:16. Thus says the Lord of hosts, do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They make you worthless. They speak a vision of their own heart, not from the mouth of the Lord. We're hoping to offer a little balance to all of the hateful rhetoric that's out in the country, and especially coming from churches and from politicians who are using churches and using trans people and drag queens as their props. In the Old Testament, punishment for false prophets was severe, as we read in Deuteronomy 18.20. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. In the New Testament, Jesus warns his followers about false prophets as we read in Matthew 7, 15 through 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Jesus then gives a dire warning to false prophets as we read in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Supporters came early and sad. My name is Joanne Fabrics. Also, um, I'm Pastor Sam Lundquist at St. John's Presbyterian Church. And they listen to the message. And he led his flock into the wilderness. Scripture teaches believers to be diligent in faith and devotion to Christ's teachings so that they will be able to spot false prophets and false teachers quickly. 1 John 4, 1 Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. What does it mean to test the spirits? The reason for the admonition to test the spirits, or test all things, is that there are many false prophets, or wolves in sheep's clothing, that try to lead Christians astray. Sadly, there are many people who claim to speak for God, who are presenting a false gospel that is powerless to save. Such errant teaching leaves people with a false hope of salvation. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15 warns us, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. 
Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. The reason for testing the spirits is to see if it is truly from God, or if it is a lie from Satan and his servants. The test is to compare what is being taught with the clear teaching of the Bible. The Bible alone is the Word of God. It alone is inspired and inerrant. Therefore, the way to test the spirits is to see if what is being taught is in line with the clear teaching of Scripture. In Acts 17, 10, and 11, the Berean Jews were commended because after they heard the teachings of Paul and Silas, they examined the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. The Bereans were called noble for doing so. Testing the spirits means that one must know how to examine the scriptures. Rather than accept every teaching, discerning Christians diligently study the scriptures. Then they know what the Bible says and therefore can test all things and hold fast to what is true. In order to do this, a Christian must be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word of God is to be a lamp and a light to our path. We must let its light shine on the teachings and doctrines of the day. The Bible alone is the standard by which all truth must be judged. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And there was song. And thou my I think that Pride Month especially is extremely important these days because so many of us come up in shame, and that's why we need pride. Reverend Floyd says not everyone supported the church hosting the event. Because of the recent um, protests in Petaluma and in Loomis Basin up near Roseville and other places, uh, and because of some of the irate emails we've gotten, we, we, we've, I think, responded with a lot of security uh, considerations, and we don't expect anything to go wrong today. Recently, a drag event in the South Bay also drew some pushback online. Events like today's Drag Queen Bible Story Hour come as lawmakers in states across the country have introduced bills to restrict LGBTQ rights. Earlier this month, a federal judge in Tennessee struck down the state's law aimed at restricting drag performances, ruling it unconstitutional. I hope people take joy away and um, the kind of joy, we always say, the kind of joy the world can't give. That we are creative beings. It's just in our core. And to, to tell someone that they can't be what their imagination tells them they can, that's, that's a... That's a violation of what's sacred about us. The Bible tells us these false prophets will twist God's word, as we read in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, as written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, and which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. The last days church will not follow the truth in the Bible. They will find false teachers to tell them their sin is okay. And not just that it is okay, but it is biblical, as we read in 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. This is what last day's Christianity looks like. It is a Christianity that says there are many paths to heaven. When the Bible clearly says Jesus Christ is the only way, it is a Christianity that approves of homosexuality, fornication. If you are having sex and you are not married, it's not called dating, it's called fornication. And abortion, even though God says these things are sin, it is a Christianity that in its church services look just like the world. Jesus goes on to tell us the last day's church will be such a worldly, Christ-rejecting church that he has been thrown out, as we read in Revelation 3.14-22. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, 
and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold, refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In these verses of Scripture, Jesus is talking about the last day's lukewarm church, a church that has one foot in the world and one foot in the church. This church is so disgustingly lukewarm that Jesus vomits it out of his mouth. Jesus counsels the last day's church to buy from him gold, which is purity, white garments, which is righteousness, and isab, which is truth. These three things can only come from the purity, righteousness, and truth that Jesus offers through salvation in him. Jesus is now standing outside the door of the last day's Laodicean church, offering salvation to anyone who will listen. This is the grace and mercy of God. He has been kicked out of his own church, and yet still knocks and offers salvation to anyone who hears his voice and opens the door. I implore you today, if you are not saved, or are a lukewarm Christian, to take up Jesus' offer of salvation that can only be received through him and only him. John 14.6 Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. This morning, as millions across the southeast face record-breaking heat, heavy rain, and no power, yet another round of severe weather and tornadoes are taking their toll. The latest strike in Moss Point, Mississippi, downing trees and power lines in the small Gulf town, ripping roofs off homes, and stripping the steeple from this church. I'm still shook up, man, because I'm thankful to be alive. It's one of at least 18 reported tornadoes across the region in the last week, claiming at least six lives, including one in Lewin, Mississippi. Felt like a giant was hitting the house with a sledgehammer. Derry Pierce felt the storm's brutal strength, an EF3 tornado striking in the dead of night, injuring nearly two dozen and taking the life of 67-year-old Georgine Hayes. Her house, where the black Jeep at? Right there. It, it was right there. It, 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 it's gone now. Ain't nothing there. In nearby Canton, Mississippi, more heartbreak after 67-year-old Wilbert Maine Fleming was killed by a falling tree. It, this hurt right now. Oh, God. Down in Florida, the storms also took a toll, with one confirmed tornado in the panhandle. Heavy rain also caused flash floods in southern Alabama, turning streets into raging rivers. This as 35 million residents in the region swelter under blistering heat. It's like 94 inside. Tonight, new video showing the terrifying moments that tornado tore through Moss Point, Mississippi. Oh, no. A worker sitting in his van Monday when the sky turned ominously dark. I was just about to go home. Oh, my God. A tree shattering the window. That EF2 twister hacking winds of 130 miles an hour. Six people hurt, an estimated 100 structures damaged, and we're hearing harrowing stories of survival. If we hadn't went downstairs when we did, uh, we wouldn't be here. Terry Crane and his son among those in the M&M Bank building when the twister struck, racing downstairs to shelter when the warning sounded on his phone. So all we could do is, is duck under some desk and a corner and pray. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? We live in a world full of pain and suffering. And there is no one, including Christians, who are not affected by the hard realities of life. The question 
why do bad things happen to good people, is one of the most difficult questions in all of theology. God is sovereign, so all that happens must be allowed by Him, if not directly caused by Him. We must understand that human beings cannot expect to fully understand God's thoughts and ways as we read in Isaiah 55, 8, and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In the book of Job, Job was a righteous man, yet he suffered in ways that none of us can even imagine, as we read in Job 1.1. 1, 1. There was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. God allowed Satan to do everything he wanted to Job except kill him, and Satan did his worst. What was Job's reaction? Job's reaction was to trust God and to bless him. Job 121, and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job 1315, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. Job didn't understand why God had allowed the things he did, but he knew God was good and therefore continued to trust in him. That should be a believer in Jesus' reaction as well. As hard as it is to acknowledge, we must admit to ourselves that we are sinners and there are no good people, as we read in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Even on your best day, we are like filthy rags, as we read in Isaiah 64.6. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Bad things may happen to good people in this world, but this world is not the end. Christians have an eternal perspective, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 16-18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Bad things happen to good people, but God uses those bad things for good, as we read in Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Bad things happen to good people, but those bad things equip believers for deeper ministry, as we read in 2 Corinthians 1, 3-5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Bad things happen to good people, and the worst things happen to the best person. Jesus is the only truly righteous one, yet he suffered more than we can imagine, and we should follow in his footsteps, as we read in 1 Peter 2, 20-23. For what credit is it if, when you are beaten, for your faults, you take it patiently. But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. Romans 5.8 declares, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Despite our sinful nature, God still loves us. God loves the world so much that he sent his only begotten Son to die for us, as we read in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God allows things to happen for a reason. Whether or not we understand His reasons, we must remember that God is good, just, loving, and merciful. Psalm 135.3 Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to His name, 
for it is pleasant. Bad things happen to us that we simply cannot understand. Instead of doubting God's goodness, our reaction should be to trust Him. As we read in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. People are trying whatever they can to get some relief from the heat. In India's Uttar Pradesh and Bihar states, hospitals and morgues are struggling to cope with the numbers. Doctors are doing what they can, but for some, it's too late. Patients' relatives are trying to shield their loved ones from the unrelenting sun. There is no fan over the patient. I've covered the window with a piece of cloth to protect my relative from the direct rays of the sun. Even inside the hospital, there's no way to protect a patient from the heat. While high temperatures aren't uncommon in this part of the country for this time of year, the Celsius has been consistently above average. To qualify as a heat wave, temperatures need to be at least 4.5 degrees above normal or above 45 degrees Celsius. Medical facilities are overwhelmed. Rubbish is piling up and hospital beds are in short supply. The hospital staff advised me to spread a bed sheet on the floor and get treatment. Last night, I saw that people were being treated on the floor. This hospital isn't functioning. Making matters worse, in Uttar Pradesh, there's unreliable power supply. The air conditioning doesn't work properly despite there being a heat wave. It's a great problem for the patients. There's no respite from the heat even inside the hospital. Despite the challenges, this doctor says they're working non-stop. All staff are working 24 hours a day to treat the patients. We are not resting even for a minute. As the number of patients grows, officials say efforts are being made to transport severe cases to better resourced hospitals in nearby cities. The dangerous heat across the South. Texas residents are now being asked to conserve power and triple amid triple digit temperatures. Janae Norman is in San Antonio for us. It is the kind of heat that you feel as soon as you step outside. University Hospital here in San Antonio has been responding to heat related calls as it is sweltering. It reached a temperature, a daily high of 105 degrees here in San Antonio. The second day of record temperatures, just one of the temperatures, record temperatures reached across the state of Texas. It's not cooling down anytime soon. Uh, Texas is going to continue to bake for a while with heat index values as high as 120 degrees. Health officials opening more than two. 200 cooling stations across the state, and they are urging people to take action at the first signs of heat illness. So muscle cramps, heavy sweating, dizziness, nausea, and reminding folks to hydrate and not to leave kids or pets in cars even for just a few minutes. Now, this type of heat is not new to Texas, of course, though it is early, more typical in July and August. But experts say this ongoing heat wave is more likely because of human-caused climate change that is warming the atmosphere and amplifying extreme temperatures. God controls the skies and the rain. God controls the wind. God has power over the clouds. God has power over lightning. God is in control of all things, including the weather. Through his providence, God provides for and protects his children. But he also permits Satan, demons, and mankind to exercise their limited will to commit acts of sin, evil, and wickedness. We may not always know why evil acts or natural disasters happen. But we can be assured that God is working all things together for his purpose and for our good, as we read in Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Global warming is advancing faster than expected in Europe. An annual report by the World Meteorological Organization and the European Copernicus Network says the average temperature on the continent is 2.3 degrees warmer than it was at the end of the 19th century. This overheating doubles the global average and fuels exceptional heat waves and droughts. As can be seen in this graph, warming has soared since the 1990s, breaking temperature records on several occasions. The heating has been uneven geographically, reaching around 2 degrees above average in much of Western Europe and even exceeding 3.5 degrees in regions close to the Arctic. 
Summer last year was the hottest on record in many European countries. The report says extreme weather-related events have claimed more than 16,000 lives and directly affected 156,000 people. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. A magnitude 6.3 earthquake rocks the Philippine province of Batangas Thursday morning. The epicenter was located in Calatagan town. But the strong tremor also felt in Metro Manila, where intensity 4 was recorded in several areas. Several aftershocks have been recorded and a tsunami warning unlikely to be raised. A 4.4 magnitude earthquake hit Northern California at around 8.45 tonight. The U.S. Geological Survey says it struck at around 8.45 just west of Clear Lake outside of Ukiah. So far, there are no reports of any extensive damage. A third strong tremor hit the west coast of France on Saturday morning, registering 5.1 on the Richter scale. On Friday, a tremor of 5.8 hit in the early evening forcing the 500 or so residents in the village of La Laine to be evacuated after cracks appeared in many of their homes. They were given shelter in municipal buildings in neighboring villages. The tremors also affected the town of Nior, resulting in several minor injuries and some 1,100 homes losing power. Psalm 18.7 Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Neighborhood clinics, emergency rooms, and critical care units in hospitals all over Chile are struggling to cope with an epidemic of the syncytial virus. Every winter, the virus shows its ugly face. It has a high mortality rate in babies, less than a year old. But this year, toddlers and even young schoolchildren are becoming seriously ill. Outside the Calvo McKenna Pediatric Hospital in Santiago, Hernan Leva tells us that he and his wife have been sleeping in the halls of the intensive care unit for a week while their one-year-old daughter fights for her life. We've seen some terrible cases. Yesterday, a baby had respiratory failure. The doctor's running around like mad to save her, and we're all there watching. It's terrifying for parents. This morning, his toddler improved but many others haven't survived. <laughs> two infants, both two months old, were buried in this cemetery earlier this month. One because there were no critical care beds left. The other because the ambulance arrived too late. 
There's no vaccine for this virus that impacts children under the age of one the most. During the years of pandemic, in which there was a low circulation of other viruses, the normal immunological cycle was altered, creating more vulnerability. Just like during the coronavirus pandemic, hospitals and staff are overwhelmed. The head of the pediatric critical care unit of one of Santiago's largest private hospitals has turned this adult intensive care area into a pediatric wing. This viral outbreak is the worst we've experienced since Chile began recording respiratory viruses and has been concentrated in a very short period of time, which is why the intensive care beds are full. To make matters worse, the smog levels here in the Valley of Santiago have increased dramatically this winter. And as we all know, that substantially increases the number of people that suffer from respiratory diseases, both young and old. That's why something else reminiscent of the pandemic is back face masks. Although not mandatory yet in public transport, the health ministry is distributing free face masks at metro stations and bus stations, encouraging everyone to use them again. Children five and older must wear them in school. By all accounts, it will be a tough winter for Chileans as they prepare for the arrival of other seasonal viruses such as influenza to add to their respiratory woes. Do you know what the most important news story of our generation will be? What is the biggest event that will shake the entire earth within the lifetime of most of you? The second coming of Christ will be the most important event of this generation. If the King of Kings is returning soon to establish the kingdom of God upon this earth, you should be getting ready for it. The Lord Jesus foretold that there would be plagues or pestilences in various places in the last days before he returns, as we read in Luke 21.11. And there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Satan is very busy in these last days trying to deceive the masses into believing climate change is causing everything that is wrong with the planet. In reality, it is God warning an unbelieving and unrepentant world that judgment is coming. These things are happening in various places around the world, just as the Lord said they would. Time is over. Get ready. Jesus Christ is coming back. Zephaniah 2, 1 through 3. Gather yourselves together, yes, gather together, O undesirable nation, before the decree is issued, or the day passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. In verse 3, where the prophet Zephaniah stated, It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Many people believe this to be a reference to the rapture of the church. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, Watch therefore, for you do not know the hour your Lord is coming. I want you to know, church, that Jesus Christ could come this month. Or he might come next week. Or he could even come... If you consider yourself a follower of Jesus, then you should pay close attention to his instruction to you. Watch therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. 
all you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.